What do we look for in a good quadricep exercise? Well, we look for the exact same things as we do for other muscle groups. You can check those out in the description. Not to repeat myself verbatim, but here's what we look for when selecting what is a good exercise according to the science for the quads. The first criteria is stability. If an exercise is wildly unstable, it will limit how much force you can produce. Think about this. Let's say you were squatting on a BOSU ball. Do you really think your quads would be able to exert maximum force and thus get a good hypertrophy effect as compared to a regular squat, where you're just standing on much more stable ground? Indeed, there's evidence suggesting that unstable training will result in lower force production than more stable training. The next thing any good exercise for the quadriceps should do is target one of the quadriceps' functions. And when we're looking at your whole exercise selection, we want to make sure that you target most of the functions of a given muscle group so we get a complete stimulus for hypertrophy. Next, for a good quadricep exercise, well, the quadriceps should be the limiting muscle group. It shouldn't be anything else but the quads that give up first, ideally. So something like conventional deadlift or even a sumo deadlift may not be ideal for the quadriceps because other muscle groups like the hamstrings or the glutes or the adductors may very well give out first. If we want to maximize hypertrophy, we want the target muscle group to be the limiting factor. Next, we want the exercise we select for quadricep growth to be stretch friendly. Let me break down what that means. There's two components here. The first one is position. The exercise should put the target muscle group, in this case the quads, into a lengthened position. Secondly, the target exercise should place the quads in that lengthened position under tension. So it shouldn't just be an unweighted stretch at the bottom, it should be a position where you have to forcefully contract the target muscle group and get more growth that way. Indeed, this is the exact area of research that I've specialized in, finishing my PhD recently on. Based on these two factors, you can compare something like a leg extension to a reverse Nordic curl. A reverse Nordic curl would be better than a leg extension because it both puts the quads in a more lengthened position by going into deeper knee flexion, and it also places more tension in that lengthened position than a leg extension does. Finally, beyond just putting the target muscle group in a position where it is lengthened and making that muscle work in that lengthened position by having it produce plenty of force, bonus points if that exercise is also well suited to doing lengthened partials. As came out of my PhD, there have now been five studies comparing lengthened partials to full range of motion, and lengthened partials might be advantageous when it comes to maximizing muscle growth. So, when picking exercises for the quads, we may want to pick exercises where you can safely perform lengthened partials. Here are a couple bonus points for exercise selection. One, we want the exercise to be time efficient. This is mostly or exclusively relevant if you're someone who doesn't have much time or enough time to train at your disposal, but in general, we want to pick exercises that are a bit more time efficient if we can. Less time efficient exercises usually include barbell exercises. When you're loading a barbell, getting ready for that exercise, it'll take quite a while to set up versus something like a dumbbell exercise or even a stack loaded machine. The final point, and a point in which barbells actually went out, is micro loadability. What's the smallest increment you can load a barbell with? Very, very small. By comparison, if you're doing a cable exercise, which yes, more time efficient, the increments there are quite large. So for certain exercises, having that micro loadability, those small increments to load by, is beneficial in terms of facilitating progression week to week. Before we go into what the best exercises for the quads actually are, based on all the criteria I just mentioned, we need to make sure we understand what the anatomy of the quadriceps is. Now, as the name implies, quadriceps basically stands for four heads. There are four parts to the quadriceps. There is the rectus femoris muscle, there is the vastus lateralis, medialis, and intermedius muscle. Fortunately, the quads aren't too complicated. Let me break it down. All four of these muscles do knee extension. Exactly the movement you do in a leg extension is actually what the quad muscles do. However, the one exception there is that the rectus femoris also does hip flexion. So when we're training the quadriceps, the main thing to look for will be knee extension. To a lesser extent, you could include some hip flexion exercises in your program if you specifically want to target the rectus femoris. However, that should be a minority of your program. The implication of these functions is that the quads will be most lengthened when your knees are fully flexed for the vastus lateralis, intermedius, and lateralis, since these don't do anything at the hip, just flexing the knee will maximally lengthen them. And for the rectus femoris, you don't just want to flex the knee fully, you also want to keep your hips as extended as possible to lengthen the rectus femoris. And this brings me to an interesting implication for quadricep hypertrophy. We don't want to pick an exercise where a biarticular muscle, like the rectus femoris, that does something at both the hip and the knee, we don't want to pick exercises where that muscle is shortening at one joint while lengthening at the other. We have evidence for both the hamstrings, for example, in the squat, 
and for the rectus femoris in the squat, that picking an exercise where a biarticular muscle lengthens at one joint while shortening at the other doesn't really produce hypertrophy very well. And so for these biarticular muscle groups, we want to pick an exercise that either does both of its functions at the same time or just isolates one of the joints and performs its action at that joint. For example, something like a squat or a lunge won't be ideal for the rectus femoris because the rectus femoris will be shortening at one joint while lengthening at the other. However, something like a reverse Nordic curl where you're isolating motion at only the knee joint allows the rectus femoris to be trained effectively. So generally, we can select compound exercises where both the hips and the knees move for the vasti muscles, those three muscles that only act at the knee, but for the rectus femoris, we'll want to pick isolation exercises where only one of those functions is being trained at once, ideally knee extension, as that's the main function that will also hit the other quadricep muscles. We'll need to include both isolation and compound exercises in your program to get both rectus femoris growth, but also overall quad growth. And indeed, this was evidenced by a recent study that hasn't been published yet, that I was involved in at Brad Schoenfeld's lab in New York, where we compared the effects of leg extensions and leg press on quad growth. Participants simply performed either leg extensions with one leg or leg press with the other. And basically, the rectus femoris grew more when doing leg extensions, but the other muscle groups grew a little bit more when doing leg press, suggesting you do want both in your program if you want maximum overall quad growth. So with all that nerdery about criteria for exercise selection based on the evidence and the anatomy of the quadriceps, without further ado, let me present you with my picks for the exercises that will produce the most quadricep growth. In the compound exercise category, I think the single best quad exercise is the Smith machine squat. Now, you could argue the feet forward Smith machine squat is equally effective, and for the quads, it might actually be a bit better because it shifts the emphasis from overall lower body development, minus the hamstrings, to just the quads, making sure they're the limiting factor. But if I had to pick one great exercise within your program to make quad gains and overall lower body gains, I would pick the Smith Machine Squat. If you're only going for quad development, I would probably pick the Feet Forward Smith Machine Squat. All of the following applies to both the Smith Machine Squat and the Feet Forward Smith Machine Squat. We're talking about great stability. The only direction the bar is going is up and down. You can focus merely on extending your knees and pushing that bar up as opposed to having to worry about stability concerns. Especially for the feet forward Smith Machine Squat, the quads should be the limiting factor. With the regular Smith Machine Squat, you have a chance of the quads not being limiting factor, but at any rate, they will be quite close to failure at the end of the set. Now, a really important thing about the Smith Machine Squat as a compound is that it's very stretch friendly. Let's review the components. First, it definitely places the quads, minus the rectus femoris, but that's the case for any compound, into that deep lengthened position, going as deep as you can. And in fact, simply by putting your feet forward, you might find you're able to get deeper and get a deeper stretch on your quads if you find usually that your depth is lacking. The second component is resistance curve. With a Smith Machine squat, you definitely have a lot of tension at the bottom of each rep. And the final component, which is why I prefer the Smith Machine squat over other squatting variations, is that it's very length and partial friendly. In fact, you can unrack the weight in that middle position of the lift and just get straight into your length and partial set. And let's say, for example, you fail a rep. Well, you can just re-rack it. Whereas with regular squats, you might have trouble re-racking it at the end if you're going very close to failure and doing length and partials. So between being able to just start the set in that length and position already, and being able to just re-rack the weight at any time if you were to fail a full range of motion rep that might be otherwise dangerous during a full range of motion squat with free weights, and even being able to set up stops at the top of the range of motion so you just work in that lengthened position, I think the Smith Machine is a great option and is super stretch friendly and even length and partial friendly. So as far as a compound exercise that will target knee extension and target those vastus muscles or vasti muscles, the Smith Machine Squat and the Feet Forward Smith Machine Squat, I think, may just be your best options, particularly with regards to how they allow you to do length and partials better than a barbell squat would. I think honorable mentions go to the leg press and the hack squat. The reason why I don't think these are quite as good as the Smith Machine Squat are twofold. One, depending on the hack squat or the leg press you have, you may actually find that it doesn't allow you to go as deep as just a Smith Machine would, right? Many hack squats and leg presses I've used don't allow me to get a full stretch on my quads. So that's a pretty big downside. And the second thing is a lot of hack squats and leg press are not length and partial friendly. They don't have a re-rack setting where you can re-rack it after a length and partial. You will almost always have to do a full rep in order to finish the set. So that kind of stops you from going as close to failure as you otherwise could if you had a low re-rack setting 
where you could just stop the set after you're about to fail a length and partial and not a full rep. That said, hack squats and leg press, depending on the situation, can absolutely be a great tool and oftentimes they have more flexibility with regards to the rep range they can be used in versus something like a squat where if you go above 10 or 15 reps, oftentimes you'll find you gas out, you get out of breath and your quads are no longer the limiting factor. And now for the best isolation movements for the quads, for overall quad growth, but specifically for rectus femoris growth. And here, the best exercise has to be the reverse Nordic curl. The reverse Nordic curl is a very stable exercise, especially if you have a handout to hold on to something if you need to. It has a very advantageous resistance curve wherein the lift gets harder as you lengthen the quadriceps, which is what we want. It also allows your rectus femoris to be fully lengthened by flexing the knees fully and extending the hips fully. In this position, you'll feel a deep stretch in your rectus femoris. Therefore, it's a really solid exercise for rectus femoris growth, but also just for overall quad growth. As is the case for most isolation exercises, there's not really any other muscle groups that could give out before the quads do. Maybe you could get out of breath, but on account of it just being an isolation movement, usually the first thing to give out will simply be the quads. The final thing is that the reverse Nordic curl by design is essentially a lengthened partial already. You're not fully extending the knee, you're essentially going to about 90 degrees of knee flexion at the top, and therefore, it is already functionally length and partial. And as I reviewed earlier in the video, there are now five studies comparing length and partials to four range of motion training, suggesting you might get more muscle growth by doing something like a length and partial over a four range of motion. And so, reverse Nordic curls as what is functionally a length and partial are a great option for hypertrophy. As an honorable mention, I think the sissy squat is also slept on. Now, I wouldn't actually recommend using the bench or machine people often use to do the sissy squat because this often reduces how extended your hips are. You'll essentially mimic a regular squat wherein you still flex your hips and thus you don't get your rectus femoris fully lengthened. However, if you just do a bodyweight sissy squat and keep your hips fully extended, it can be a great exercise offering many of the same benefits, resistance curve, getting a deep stretch in the rectus femoris as reverse Nordic curls do. The only reason I think they lose out a little bit compared to the reverse Nordic curl is because one, I think there are more muscle groups involved like the calves, for example, and two, in my experience, it is a little bit less stable than the reverse Nordic curl would be. However, it's a great option, and if you don't like the reverse Nordic curl, by all means, try the sissy squat. The one exercise I wouldn't really recommend anymore for quad growth as an isolation exercise would be the leg extension. While the leg extension does offer you a lot of flexibility with the rep range, it is essentially unloaded on your spine, the issue there is it is a shortened partial and the evidence we have on shortened partials or partial repetitions at shorter muscle lengths versus full range of motion versus lengthened partials, it's consistently worse for hypertrophy by maybe up to 20% or so compared to something like a lengthened partial like a reverse Nordic curl. And so leg extensions for me should be kept for when a person doesn't like reverse Nordic curls, doesn't like sissy squats or they find them painful, what have you, that's when you could use them. But most of the time, if you want more growth, take the reverse Nordic curl or the sissy squat. That's the video. If you liked the video, please comment, like, subscribe. I'm trying to upgrade the camera equipment, the editing, etc. So all support helps towards that. If you want to see me explain the best exercises according to the science for any other muscle groups, leave a comment down below and I'll get to it. That's the video. Peace.